Hey everyone, welcome to the Yes Shift podcast with Dan Schinder and his sons, Steven Schinder. For those of you not familiar with the show, this is basically what we do. We talk about Yes and Yes's members, past and present, and this is a very Wakeman-centric episode. Now, for the broadcast of this, there were some issues with my dad's audio, so um, I had to re-edit this after the fact, make it a smoother edit. His mic did start working again a little while into the show, so I ended up cutting out much of the silence that we got in like the original broadcast. The first time you'll hear my dad in this edit is actually from... Uh, take from later in the broadcast, which is why you may notice a jump if you're watching the video. And then it's just my dialogue for a little while, and then my dad's back again for the rest of the episode. So just be patient. We did have to cut out some of our tangents just because of the silence. Um, like, for example, I did mention that I saw my friend Keon's emo pop punk band, fake band practice, the other day. Uh, they were really tied to I saw them in Anaheim, and they seemed like they'd been performing for a while. Very solid performances. You should check them out if you ever get the chance. And a benefit of this edit is I also get to throw in news that just came out today on March 3rd, which is that there will be a charity concert going on May 6th in Tewksbury. This will include Oliver Wakeman, Rick Wakeman, Gordon Gildtrap, and Carrie Martin. So people can go to rosetheater.org for tickets if you're around there or want to travel there. And this is being called The Other Coronation Concert. On the website, it says, Each artist will perform their own set of material from their respective careers, but will also make guest appearances in each other's sets throughout the show to create a truly unique one-off concert. So that sounds very exciting. And with that, just sit back and enjoy this smoother edit of this episode of Yes Shift. So for this episode, uh, we're going to be talking about some Oliver Wakeman news, um, as well as the Palladium shows that his father Rick did, and Adam Wakeman was also part of that, and of course, Rick's latest album, A Gallery of Imagination. So, uh, yeah, so on our doc that we have, I have, like, I put them in an order, but I figure we can go in, like, whatever order, so what would you prefer to start with? Okay, um, well, do you want to start with Oliver's stuff or Rick's stuff? Okay, yeah, so, uh, uh, of course, recently it was Oliver's birthday on the 26th, and we sort of commemorated that on our last news episode, but lo and behold, there's been more Oliver news, so let's get into this. Um, so he recently posted his 2022 year in review on his website. Uh, which I'll go ahead and drop the link in the show notes and the comments. Um, you know, basically recapping all the stuff that he was up to that year, which we, we were able to talk about. And then on February 16th, uh, Carrie Martin, uh, she posted a video of herself playing a song acoustically, uh, which I'll drop the link in a moment as well. And Oliver shared that video saying, great song and a lot of fun to add my keyboards to it. First time I've broken out the Moog for a Carrie Martin track. Um, and then on the 18th, there was another update on Oliver's upcoming album, Anam Kara, you know, the Celtic influenced album. Uh, he writes, another great evening going through the guitar souls for the new album with David Mark Pierce. Sounding great and so emotive. I think we're nearly there with all the electric guitar parts. And then on the 28th, uh, this actually got sent to us. So this news uh, was sent to us by Stephen Lamb, author of Yes in the 1980s, uh, who I think is also the co-founder of this festival, the Summer's End Festival. 
so this is happening in October, October 5th through 8th. Um, I believe it it's in England. I trying to look up like where exactly in England it is. Um, but did you all read that quote there where it says like what Oliver's uh, performing there? Headlining the Saturday will be an exclusive performance by Oliver Wakeman's Anamkara. Oliver and band members from his latest project perform songs from the new Anamkara record, record, the live premiere of the Yes record from a page which has never been performed live. That's interesting. Great mm -hmm. album. As well as songs from the award-winning Ravens and Lullabies album, which Steve and I covered when it came out. Great album. F, part of that box set and the band will include Haley Griffith on vocals, Scott Higgum on drums and Oliver Day on guitars. Yeah. That I bet that would be great. Is he ever coming to the States to tour? <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, if Oliver ever comes to the States, like in our neck of the woods, it would be amazing to see him play. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that. I imagine Anamkara is gonna probably come out around that same time, like September, October. Or mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious to see whether the material premieres at the festival or or if the album comes out beforehand. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, from a page has never been performed live. I, I think Oliver was almost going to perform it live and then the pandemic happened. So uh, that didn't end up happening. But yeah, that short Yes album or EP, I guess you could call it. Um, it I'm very curious to see how it how it is in the live setting because because stuff like to the moment would sound amazing live, you know. So last year, uh, we reviewed Ravens and Lullabies uh, as part of that collaborations box set release. And we were really into that, what he and Gordon Giltrap did with that. Um, yeah, I'm really curious how many tracks from that and from Anamkara he'll be playing. Like in my head, I'm thinking of like four or five because there are four or five tracks on from a page, but I don't know how long this set list will be. So it's just a shot in the dark, you know? So this festival is taking place in Chepstow. Um, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, again, October 5th through 8th. And other headliners include Seller Darling and Threshold. Um, I'm not very familiar with them, but Seller Darling is a Swiss prog rock trio and Threshold is a UK prog rock quintet. So I may have to check those out and see what they're like. Um, and just today there was a preview, like a one minute preview that dropped of a Rodney Matthews uh, single. So yeah, so this is titled... Um, Lost in the Wild Wood. Okay, I didn't want to butcher the words there. Um, and this comes out sometime in March. So it says the latest winter music offering. The single is now available for advanced ordering, and I'll drop the link in a moment. Uh, the piece of music written by Tony Clarkin and Pete Coleman combines three styles, folk, rock, and jazz blues. And so... We have Tony Clarkin on guitar, Bob Catley on vocals, Oliver on keys, of course. Uh, Pete Coleman is a multi-instrumentalist on there. Roberto Vitelli on bass, Charlotte Dickerson on vocals, Claire Hines on, uh, it says, Electro, Hurdy, Gertie, um, and Rodney on drums. <laughs> Wait, so is that a real thing, a Hurdy Gertie? Okay, so... Yeah, because the name sounded made up, so I wasn't sure. But yeah, it, de it definitely looks like some older like if storybooks that focus on animals, that type of thing. It it's rocking. Like, you know, sometimes there are previews of songs that get dropped uh, online and then you're like, uh, I'm not so sure about this. I'll need to hear more of it. But this one minute excerpt that they dropped is it it's packed with like the right stuff. It makes me excited for it. So very high praise indeed for that preview. Um, all right, so that's the Oliver Wakeman news. And again, a happy birthday to him. Um, so do you want to talk about the 
Palladium shows. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about Rick's comments on the yes portion when we get through the when we talk about the set list. But so yeah, go ahead and read the lineup. Okay, so in lieu of my dad reading the lineup, I'm just gonna read it here in the edit. So we got Dave Cal Cahoon on guitars and backing vocals, Adam Faulkner on drums, Lee Pomeroy on bass and backing vocals. Haley Sanderson on vocals, Adam Wakeman on keys, guitars, and backing vocals, Ed Skoll on percussion, and the English Chamber Choir and a guest narrator. Yeah, I wasn't able to find out uh, who the narrator was, but um, but yeah, there. So there are. This was not professionally filmed, but there were like audience shot clips on YouTube and. Just extrapolating from what I was able to see, it seems like both nights were really solid performances. Um, so on the 22nd, they performed Six Wives of Henry VIII, Myths and Legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And uh, there are also like some, I, I got some of the songs from like Setlist FM, so that was very helpful. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, they were probably, like, I, I don't know how much it costs, but I imagine, like, it, it probably is, like, kind of expensive. Um, I know that in um, one of the recent Roger Dean live streams, someone asked if he w was at the Palladium shows or would be going to the Palladium shows, and uh, apparently, like, there wasn't enough planning in advance on i guess his end or their end or something to like make that happen um but yeah just as first night alone six wives and king arthur and uh for the encore uh, for merlin the magician there's like a keytards and guitar jam by rick and adam and dave and yeah um and of course all the narration was played on tape but yeah, what? But yeah, these two albums, honestly, in my head, they're not. I don't imagine like pairing them together. Like, if anything, I would pair King Arthur and Journey together because they're like both based on, uh, like old stories, like literature instead of like actual history, and they have like vocals and stuff. But then again, I could maybe see the benefit of having an album that's all instrumental paired with one of these and the other one the next night. So yeah, I I'm pretty sure it wasn't filmed, but if there's like a live audio album of these, like that would be amazing. Uh, so for the next night, uh, the first set had classic Yes music and the second set had Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, and with Starship Trooper as the encore. So uh, I have Rick's comments about the yes portion. I'm real curious about the note that's in the yes set list for Rick's show about Wondrous Stories being a new arrangement that's kind of rocked out. I can't even imagine what that sounded like. So if anyone was there, let us know. Or I'm sure there's some stuff on YouTube that'll surface. Yeah, I, I did see a bit of that today. Like there's a clip that just came out today that someone posted and yeah it's a little bit rocking um it's not like full-on rock and roll but it's like a little bit more upbeat type of thing okay cool um yeah and um i have rick's comments about the yes uh set list up here uh so he says he talks about how yes music means an awful lot to him and uh as well as the fans and so uh, he says, I was extremely conscious that if I got this wrong, then a lot of people would be very upset. And so from the outset, we worked on the music being respectful and true to the original, but not trying to copy. And I genuinely felt we did that. We opened with Roundabout, which is normally a finishing or encore piece. And when the last chord died away, the audience reaction filled me with warmth. And I felt we had got it just right. We put a medley together of The Meeting, Wondrous Stories, and South Side of the Sky, which for me was a fun way of integrating three completely different parts of my yes life. And You and I was the band's idea. You cannot leave And You and I out, they said, and so we didn't, and I'm glad they were right. Um, and 
Yeah, he also mentions how like the Encore was Starship Trooper, their own version of it. Um, and after the Encore, he says, I collapsed completely knackered in the dressing room. Um, yeah, it's interesting that they included the meeting, even though yeah. that's an APWH thing. Um, uh, speaking of which, I saw that um, I got an email from Burning Shed where they talk about their new releases. Apparently, there's a blue vinyl of the ABWH album, but when I checked earlier, it sold out, so I don't know if it'll be back in stock sometime hmm. soon. And they included it in Songs from Songas on the 35th anniversary tour, which I thought was yeah. weird then, too, that they would take that space up where there's so many other... But I guess they consider it a yes song. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for Songs from Songas, it was... Um, Part of, it was right after a solo Rick song called The Meeting Room. So I guess they figured it'd be a nice two well, part thing. I don't know. Also, it was a nice piece for him to do with John that leads into their acoustic set. But I don't understand why he would do it here without John. It's not this, it's, it's kind of a reach. No offense, Rick, because. Ah, whatever. Anyways, it is a beautiful song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to minimize that. Right. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think Haley Sanderson did a good job with the vocals for the Yes material, as well as the Rick solo material. Uh, she actually, uh, like you and I were talking about this earlier, she performed on the re-recorded versions of Journey and King Arthur. So yeah. Uh, was kind of a return for her, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, from the looks of it, um, both shows seemed really solid. Uh, there's a nice review on Prog Report uh, by Jeff Bailey that goes into some detail. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, I really wish that they had filmed it and because it's like, how could you not film it? You yeah. Know? Maybe um, they did. I and mean, we don't know? Uh, I mean, in the footage I saw, I don't see, like, any, like, big cam cameras. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway. Um, so, uh, also, um, speaking of Adam, uh, apparently this was, like, not, this was not on my radar, but apparently he's been touring with uh, singer-songwriter Damien Wilson in the UK lately, so that's mm. kind of cool. Yeah. Um, uh yeah um so i guess now we can go into a gallery of oh during starship trooper uh adam's keytar uh, didn't work during the verm part so oh. he just played the keyboards instead but huh. yeah just a little hiccup but it was still a cool performance that's great wish we yeah. could have gone to that yeah, but I mean, we had like, it was during like the wedding, you know? So yeah. Even if we could like go, like we wouldn't have been able to go. <laughs> yeah. My other son got married this past week and that's where we were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess we could go into a gallery of imagination. Um, you have the cover photo for that, right? Yeah, we have it up. What do you think of the cover art? Um, I think it looks nice, um, s although someone pointed out that it looks kind of like ELP's pictures at an exhibition. So That's what I've mentioned, to, like, too. I agree. Separate. Yeah. <laughs> I, but, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I can't help but still equate Rick to Roger Dean, hmm. even though, you know, he was in the first iteration of Yes!, that Roger collaborated with them, number one. Number two, journey, Return to the Center of the Earth. We saw that amazing painting in person at his, Roger and Frey's exhibition, and it was just so breathtaking. So I still feel that unearthly connection. And <laughs> for this to come out, I, I hate to criticize someone who I love so much musically and and more but this just seems so pedestrian compared to the music that's on it you know i don't mm -hmm. know it just leaves a little i'm a little underwhelmed to be honest yeah and, and i think roger is still working with rick or might work with him on something so um if i remember correctly i'd have to like look at the streams again but 
Yeah, I, I, like the album cover, it does convey the title, but I see where you're coming from. Like, it kind of looks like it could be from any artist. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Uh, like, it, it also kind of reminds me, like, the aesthetic of it kind of reminds me of Sherlock Holmes, because I'm so used to the Sherlock Holmes books kind of having that, like, silhouette type of look. Um. I yeah, didn't just, think of that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. But, yeah, but as for the music, so the tracks are as follows. Hidden Depths, The Man in the Moon, A Mirage in the Clouds, The Creek, The Moonlight Dream, Only When I Cry, Cuban Carnival, Just a Memory, The Dinner Party, A Day Spent on the Pier, The Visitation, and The Eyes of a Child. Um, and we also have like a a uh, description of like the whole concept of this album did you all read that part yeah sorry i got lost listening to you um <laughs> <laughs> the 2023 concept album from keyboard legend rick wakeman and the english rock ensemble is a diverse affair featuring prog pieces with soaring moog solos solo piano numbers and eight unconventional vocal tracks the conception of the album began at the age of five. Rick's childhood piano teacher, Mrs. Symes, taught him that musicians with instruments are like artists with paint, something that Rick carried through his life, creating sonic paintings through his composition. Wakeman says, One of my great loves is going into museums and art galleries and seeing all the different types of art. So I thought, why not a music gallery? A gallery of the imagination? People can paint their own mind pictures to the different types of music that are on the album. It is very diverse, and for me it works very well because the concept holds it together. It is, very, it is a very tactile album, Rick explains. I'd like to feel that people can actually touch the music. Close to the Edge feels that way for me, by the way. Uh, yeah. Fans and, and the imagination of that place, just uh, fans are encouraged to create their own artworks inspired by the music, which one day Rick hopes to be displayed. The lineup on A Gallery of Imagination, as with Rick's previous album, The Red Planet, features bassist Lee Pomeroy, guitarist Dave Cal Cahoon, drummer Ash Stone, and on vocals, Haley Sanderson. I forgot Ash Stone was on here. I gotta reach out to him, have it on Jump Talk TV. Mm. Yeah, so what were your impressions when you gave this album a listen, Dad? So to be honest with you, I was I was surprised in the way first of all, I love it. I love it. I can't imagine Wakeman music ever letting me down. <laughs> but I do go in expecting to be fed something, you know, fulfilling. I I really like it, but the surprise for me was that there were some things on there that were not as stereotypical Rick Wakeman. Like if there were a few things that honestly, if I didn't know it was him, I wouldn't know it was him. Whereas a lot of stuff Rick does, you hear it and you just know right away that's him. You yeah. can tell the difference between him, Keith Emerson, Tony Banks, you can just tell. But there were a few things on there that were not like that. And I did like uh, the mix of vocals and I did like his return to a lot of those classic sounds, as the quote says, the soaring Moog solos and things like that. It, it's really a good album. I've only listened to it once all the way through. I do want to mention that in classic, yes, and I don't mean the lineup classic, yes, but in the classic fashion of yes, what is with the same titles repeating themselves <laughs> everywhere? You got Open Your Eyes on Open Your Eyes, then you've got it on an Asia album, and then you've got Man in the Moon and Man in the Moon and Man on the Moon, and then you've got In the Eyes of the Child appears on, help me, help me, what is we, it? We agree. We agree, that's right. And, and then you've got uh, Does It Happen? Does It Really Happen? Did It Happen? Can It Happen to You? What's Happening? Fat Albert. I mean, it's like, when I saw that title, I'm pointing over here because that's where my laptop is. When I saw that title, I thought, am I going to hear dun, 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 mm -hmm. a rework of that? I just thought that was cute. Like, it never stops. You forget about it for a few years, and then bam, it hits you again. I think there's a song, isn't there a song on Union like that that repeats from... Holding on. There you go. 
yeah, hold on. Okay, so that that aside, and that didn't bother me. I just thought it was, hey, there it is. I wonder if they're doing this on purpose. Yeah, is this I calculated? Mean, to, be, to be fair, Rick wasn't on the yes or conspiracy. Of course, version, of course not. Yeah. Yeah, and it is kind of silly to compare this against those, but yeah, you know, and that's I, not what I meant to do. Yeah, but that being said, like I've said before, that the Yes song "Man and the Moon" is one of my least favorite Yes songs, so um, I immediately prefer this one by <laughs> Rick and the English Billy's gonna be song. mad. <laughs> I like that song. No, um, I, I love a lot of the, the Billy stuff, but it's almost like that. there's this hat. And this hat has like 300 song titles. Someone picks one and uses it and accidentally puts it back in the hat and someone else chooses it later. Yeah. But um, what, what are your impressions? Oh, and I love the production. You know me. I'm a production guy. It's one of the first things I listen to when I start listening to an album. Very happy with the production. It's very up-to-date, modern, doesn't sound so pristine that it's processed. It sounds like you're there and the music's there, you know. Yeah, I, I will say that sound wise, there was a little bit uh, in like the early part of My Moonlight Dream where the drums kind of sounded a bit 80s to me, but as the song mm. progressed, they sounded more like timeless or modern, I guess. Um, but yeah, like putting it on, like starting the album, I was a little bit surprised as well because it began with like some of the. You know, I, I forgot that it was Rick and the English Rock Ensemble, so once it was just the keys, I was like, okay, it's going to be one of those types of albums. But then, like, you get the guitar and all that, and it's, like, there are some rocking parts of this yeah. album. Um, and I think, uh, I also love Haley's singing. I think if I were to choose one of these to showcase, like, what she can do on this album, I would go with A Mirage in the Clouds. Um, and you've got tracks yeah. like, and I, tracks I agree like, with that. Yeah. Yeah. And tracks like the Creek and, um, a day spent on the pier have like that nice reflective kind of feel where you can imagine being at those locations and just being introspective. Um, when Cuban carnival started playing, oh. I thought to myself, oh, this has like kind of a Caribbean influence. And then I like looked at the title and I was like, oh, of course. That yeah. And that, <laughs> that going back to the things that didn't sound like Rick, as I've tattooed his style on my brain, the way I perceive it, that was part of the biggest departure other than Teak Boy from ABWH. Right, yeah, I was yeah. definitely reminded of Teak Boy. Yeah, I could hear those two songs played in a row and I'd be fine, you know? So that great job on bringing in a whole other cultural influence, which we're not used to with his music. Yeah, uh, I think The Dinner Party is might be a favorite of mine. It's a great instrumental and just takes lots of twists and turns mm -hmm. and just keeps on going. Um, Same here. Okay, yeah. That and the um, visit to Cuba. I think because that was just so, such a surprise and refreshing, and they did such a great job at it. And of course, the Latin percussion. What, Cuban Carnival, you mean? Cuban Carnival, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I meant visiting Cuba musically is what I meant. Oh, okay, yeah. I wasn't sure if you got confused with the visitation, but okay, yeah, that makes right. sense. Um, but what do you think of the decision to end it with the eyes of a child? I'm curious, like, your take on that. I think, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, you do know. I like albums that end with a bang, just like a concert would. You know, you wouldn't end a concert with Holy Lamb or Soon <laughs> or, you know, so... I just don't want to sound too critical or cranky. It's it's a great piece of music. It's not what I would have chosen to end with. Okay. But it's a great piece of music. Would it, you like yeah. it ending like that? Because you're you're uh, often so, in favor of so softer I, endings than I am. So I like it. I'm not sure if I would have chosen it as like musically as the ending if I were making this. But you know, it's his concept album, so I'm sure there's. There's uh, that. There's a reasoning for ending yeah. with that. And there's, I mean, it's I, part of a thread. 
Yeah, and like, but all that aside, the eyes of a child, it really makes one think about like how things change as you grow up, you know, your perception of everything. And it's like, we, like we used to see differently when we were like more innocent. You well, know? and just says I'm like an eight year old. So apparently it hasn't changed much for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great album though, folks. I don't mean, again, I don't mean to sound too critical or anything. And like Steve said, you know, you're right. It is a concept album. So it's a running story. So there's a reason it is where it is. Yeah. So it definitely has some of what I imagine when I think of Rick Wakeman's <laughs> sound like to me it kind of feels like a mix between some of the 70s stuff and some of the bits of 80s stuff i'm somewhat familiar with i heard bits um, of the 70s for sure and a touch of uh return to the center of the earth okay yeah yeah, yeah that would have been 98 yeah 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 i was gonna ask you that when i was thinking about the album covers is that the last cover he did for Rick, or there was at least one since then? Uh, no, so Roger uh, did the reimaginings of uh, Journey and King Arthur. Right. Um, yeah, so those might be the most... Re there might be a couple others, um, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like, a lot of his albums are not Roger Dean, so... It kind of doesn't surprise me that this one doesn't have Yeah, them, it doesn't. It's not canon with his, you know, music and everything, which is okay because then it makes it all that much more surprise when we do get one. Right. But yeah, the cover art does make me think of books, um, just like the way that it looks. Um, yeah. And I saw a comment from Joel Perard uh, saying, um, I think he said that he hasn't listened to a gallery yet, but he really enjoyed The Red Planet, which I think was the last solo album Rick did before this. Let me just look that up real quick. Um, okay, yeah, that would have come out in 2020, so yeah. Cool. Right. Um, so do you have any other thoughts on the album before we wind down and sort of talk about what's coming up next only that i i hope he comes to the u.s i don't remember if we know whether or not there's plans for that is there oh right yeah that's actually a nice segue so um well the u.s states are listed are on the east coast but uh he is doing his music and stories tour um so today's march 2nd so 15th he's in pennsylvania then he goes to florida a couple dates there and then georgia so yeah it's looking like east coast uh from march to april hmm. um yeah up to april 15th uh, that tour ends in woodstock new york um and he's also doing the rock and romance cruise uh sometime this later this month the 16th through 23rd oh. yeah and that's out of Florida? I believe. Not California? So, yeah, it, go, Florida. it goes out from Miami. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, Rick's just keeping busy as always. Um, should we move on uh, and talk about what's coming up next on the show for us? Yeah. Yeah. Which is going to be the 8th, March 8th. Yeah. But, um, oh, but before then, uh, so. Vintage Rock Pod uh, asks us to record a segment again, uh, this time for Chris Squire's birthday. So uh, check out Vintage Rock Pod, their March 4th episode. Keep an eye out for that. Listeners. Follow them. Keep an eye yeah. out. We recorded that last night. That was last night, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so our next live show on Yes Shift is March 8th. Um, we were shooting for the 7th, but then, you know, scheduling. So it's on the 8th now at 7 p.m. Pacific. 6 p.m. Pacific. Oh, it's 6 p.m. Yeah, Pacific? 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. And yeah. uh, middle of... It actually works better for me. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's good for me, too. So join us live. Please chime in. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll be talking about Chris because uh, it'll be after his birthday. And we'll also be talking about Billy since his birthday will be coming up um, later in the month. And we'll also be talking about Peter Banks because um, March 7th will mark 10 years after 
his passing. So this will be the day after that. Um, and I also thought it'd be fun to include a little segment that's sort of Pink Floyd related. You know, this month is 50 years of Dark Side of the Moon and each of these three guys uh, took part in a couple Pink Floyd tribute albums. Uh, so um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to revisit those tracks that they played on and sort of like, you know, talk about their stuff and talk about yes and talk a little bit of floyd you know absolutely great amazing album that still holds up if it came out today it'd be ahead of its time it's just it really yeah. is timeless yeah except well, that it not... does have the song <laughs> time on it yeah so that's yeah, not quite that. timeless <laughs> yeah i've probably said this on the show before but dark side of the moon's my favorite pink floyd album yeah i think it's mine um, it's it's probably a a boring answer, like super predictable, but yeah, it's that it's that good in my opinion. Yeah, and and <laughs> there are other amazingly notable albums depending on the kind of you know what your people's sensibilities are. Metal is amazing. I love metal. I do like Animals, um, more on the commercial side, but it, I like Animals. I think that's a great album. Um, there's a couple old, old Floyd stuff that I do really like as well. Adam Hart Mother is a very interesting album. Uma Guma, which is arguably also called Uma Guma. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, that one's kind of like divisive among fans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Metal is, is really a neat album with Echoes and that. And then, of course, not an album, but a great film, the original Live at Pompeii. Um, I watched that last year. Did we watch it together? Um, I don't think we watched it together. I, I've seen bits of it a while ago. Yeah, maybe least. I watched it with, with Enja, but it's. I, I encourage people to visit that. If you've never seen it before, you must. If you haven't seen it in a long time, you must also, because you'll go, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's really good. And considering when it was made and the gear that they used and everything, and it's a whole other side of Nick Mason's drumming because from Dark Side of the Moon forward, his drumming was much, 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 much more simplistic. Whereas on a lot of material before that, he was soloing a lot and, and just playing more African type rhythms and things like that. Uh, so it's it if you haven't broadened your Floyd horizons in that direction, um, I highly recommend yeah and um i just remembered earlier i saw a post from music aid northwest um and uh they're gonna be honoring uh alan white you know it's posthumously they're uh, awarding him the icon award so it says here alan white might be known to most as a hall of fame drummer for yes but to us, he was one of our founders and a huge supporter of Music Aid Northwest and music education in our state. Along with the entire music community, we were saddened by his passing last May. At Play of Forward 11, we will be honoring Alan with an Icon Award. His wife and fellow MANW founder Gigi will accept the award on his behalf. Play It Forward is MANW's largest fundraiser and directly funds our grant program for public school music educators. This year, we will be awarding two Washington Music Icon Awards. Join us in honoring Alan White on April 29th. And I'll go ahead and drop the link in the comments and the show notes. Um, so yeah, that's very nice that they're honoring him. Yeah. Um, and also tomorrow, uh, Friday, March 3rd is Bandcamp Friday. So, um, you know, you can support bands on Bandcamp. And they'll get, like, more of the money that... Uh, I think it gets matched the... by Bandcamp or something. Like what people uh, donate, maybe Bandcamp matches it, something like that. No, it's... it's it's um So usually Bandcamp takes a cut of, how, of whatever money gets sent in to purchase the thing but for bandcamp friday bandcamp waves that so oh. like none of it goes to them it all goes to the artist cool good for them yeah yeah i, I was just stumbling on my words figuring out the best way to say that but that's yeah. right 
Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for following us. So you can find us on facebook.com slash yes shift where we go live and we put the videos on youtube.com slash at yes shift and the audio we put on anchor.fm slash yes shift and you can see all the other podcast platforms around there and click on support if you want to give us something. Donation. Uh, and you could email us ideas, suggestions, questions. Uh, anything at uh, yes shift podcast at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you we'd love for you to chime in on these episodes live or if you're seeing it on the archive chime in on all the topics in the comments that's why we do this it's a conversation it's like we're all in the room discussing uh, the music and musicians antics experiences and journeys of our favorite band and band members yeah definitely so thanks for joining us and we'll see you all soon Thanks, everybody.